Cleaning Up is brought to you by the Liebreich Foundation and the Gilardini Foundation. My name is Michael Liebreich, and this is Cleaning Up. My guest this week is Robin Chase. She's a co-founder of Zipcar, the world's leading car sharing company. She founded it in 1999, and it was sold in 2012 to Avis Budget for 400 and $91 million. So she's a very successful entrepreneur. She's gone on to start a number of other smart mobility companies, which she'll talk about during the course of this episode. She's also taken the lessons that she learned from Zipcar and the other companies and thought deeply about the future of transportation, the future of cities, and the future of our societies. Please welcome Robin Chase. So, Robin, thank you very Hi, much Michael. for joining us. And where Good are evening. you today? Where are you joining us from? I'm here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, outside of Boston. And as we film this, you've got a new president-elect, right? Yay! I'm so excited about it. Thankfully, every day I wake up feeling better and better. So I take it you didn't vote for President Trump? Absolutely, positively not. And I voted with a mail-in ballot. I oh knew my, my vote would be counted. So you, you must still be on tenterhooks as to whether that gets uh, disqualified some miraculous or some, some awful way, but, but, but most likely not. So we're, I think we're, as we've been filming this, we've gone from the day of the election to thinking we know the results to now being pretty, you know, pretty, pretty bulletproof certain, I think, at this point. I love the idea that he's going to be able to say in some future years, I never conceded, but yeah, he is now do making the transition and we are moving ahead. Now, Robin, we've got a lot to talk about because you've been a successful entrepreneur and you've, been, you've, you've started a number of the companies which are really the, the bedrock of new mobility, modern mobility, but you're also involved in some, I'm assuming, pro bono activities around the future of the city. So what I'd like to do is start first with those mobility startups and, and uh, understand a little bit more, you know, how you got into them, uh, why you took that entrepreneurial route. Uh, and then I think they segue into the broader questions of what our cities look like and how do we make sure they work well, which is what you spend a lot of time on now. So what was your, what was your first step into entrepreneurship? Was it, of course, you're the founder of Zipcar. Was that your first startup? That was my first startup, and it is 20 years ago, which is just mind-boggling to me. But it was through Zipcar that I understood the power of the private sector to move and shape markets in a, in a socially positive way. I would say that wasn't my, my desire wasn't for environmental, the environmental upside of Zipcar. But I would also say that there was no way I was going to spend a hundred hours a week and years and years of my life on something that didn't have positive social benefits. So I did Zipcar from 2000 till 2005. And what I realized then, and this became my new lifelong obsession, was that transportation is the center of our universe, in fact. And I look at it as the gateway to opportunity. So no matter what you care about, transportation is the glue that makes that possible. So are you interested in entrepreneurship, you know, or education or healthcare or equality? What are, whatever it is, it is potentiality is hindered or facilitated by transportation. So I became completely hooked on it. And I would say way later than Al Gore, um, climate change became important to me. <laughs> and then I also realized that transportation is a key contributor to emissions. So it just was wrapped up in this one industry, this one sector, all of my loves. And so I've become completely fascinated by it. And I've done several successful and failed startups in, that, in urban transportation since then. And so just what were you doing before Zipcar? I used to work in public health. I used okay. to work in public health. Um, so what was beautiful about Zipcar, just in terms of what it teed up, and I am very proud of it, um, 
a colleague at MIT wrote a book on the Internet of Things, and he says Zipcar was one of its first expressions, that we had all these vehicles parked around that you could interact with. Um, and Zipcar was the first, I'd say, platform, a really strong platform company, and first part of the sharing economy. Our, our application of wireless that you could make and the internet was really, really novel when we first started. Um, so it created a kind of fascination for me with what technology enables, what, what capitalism has the potential to do in terms of changing social, impacting social values. And I wanna say capitalism also has a huge amount of downsides. We may or may not ever get to that. But um, it, it totally sparked me. And so after that, I did a ride sharing company and I would say everyone has failed. Everyone's failed at ride sharing except for Blah Blah Car, who was a, a um, friend of mine. And it succeeded in Europe for very particular reasons. Whereas in the US, no ride sharing company has really succeeded. And then I did peer to peer car sharing, a company called Buzzcar in Paris. And that um, I was not, we were not the number one person and we um, merged with Drivey. Yeah, that became, and, that was bought by Drivey. Well, that's right. yeah. Yep, Drivey. And then they merged with Get Around in the US. Yeah. Um, and then I did a company called Venium, which is a vehicle communications company that's still thriving and going strong. My co founder is CEO, and they're out of Portugal. And they're moving data from vehicles yeah. to the cloud. And that's an important piece of as we move forward in increasingly connected vehicles the networking aspect of that, networking data aspect of that. That's the one that's called the Internet of Moving Things, correct? It is. Then in the Internet of Moving Things. Okay. Um, so let's get on to But it's so fascinating that for you, Zipcar was the kind of gateway drug into climate awareness. Is that fair to say? It I is, mean, definitely. For me, it was new energy finance. I didn't say, oh, my goodness, look at what's happening to the climate. How can I help? Let me start a clean energy information company. I said, you know, th there's a, there's a gap here and I need, uh, I, you know, I, I need to put some runs on the board as an entrepreneur and it looks like a good sector. And I kind of know a few bits and pieces. And of course, then it all started to sort of unwrap and unfold. And I thought, you know, holy moly, we really need to do something here. And, and that, that pulled me in. So it, it sounds like you probably had something of a similar uh, experience. It is. And when, when I talk to um, young people or people interested in changing their careers or anybody about climate change. It, sometimes people want to say, oh, but you know, it doesn't, you could do that because it's transportation, but this isn't something that's relevant to me. And I say, no, our entire economy is steeped in fossil fuel and every single aspect of that, whether you're a physician or an artist or whatever it is, we have to get fossil fuels out of that. So this is something that everyone can be participating yeah. in in every realm. There is nothing that is excluded from that conversation. One of the things that's been so fascinating about these um, cleaning up uh, talks is um, just how people kind of, you know, achieve the, whatever you call it, consciousness or their kind of the worldview that they've got. And there's a, this is reminding me very strongly of uh, a, a conversation with Kande Yamkela. I think it's number uh, I'm going to say number 18, cleaning up number 18, um, uh, because he kind of woke up over a period of years to the realization that energy is the red thread in development. All of the sustainable development goals you can't do without energy. And you've had a similar experience where you've sort of woken up to the fact that transport is like, oh, if we don't solve this, we solve nothing. And actually a lot of the problems stem from transportation um, maybe done badly or in an old fashioned way or, or, or in a way that doesn't price externalities, right? It's interesting. When you talk about that, I think both all of our stories is this hidden aha moment around things that are, that are embedded and incredibly important and underappreciated. And so just on this transportation point, I was part of a World Economic Forum Global Advisory Council, and they had 700 of these, I think. They had 100 of them. And there were 700 people all meeting yeah. together in Abu Dhabi. And at one point, you were supposed to meet with other groups that were related. And I, of course, think transportation is the center of everything. So are you talking about women's empowerment, education, cities, urban development, poverty, crime, like whatever? 
that you would want to talk to transportation. And it turned out no one came to talk to us. And I was, I had to say, I was agog. I was agog that people were so underappreciating that there was nothing that they were hoping to do for which transportation was not an important impediment that they needed to get around. See, the, so, the funny thing is I was also on an agenda council. I was on the agenda council for alternative energy, where our first point of, of action was we refused to meet as the alternative energy agenda council. We demanded to be called sustainable energy or clean energy. <laughs> uh, but I wanted to talk to the financiers. You know, I didn't want to go and talk to transport, even though they're, of course, you know, linked like this. I needed to go and talk to the central bankers, to the pension uh, agenda council, et cetera, et cetera, because that was our problem. And to the same point, the council that you didn't want to be on, mine was, I think, the future of transportation. And then they changed it after three years to be the future of cars. And I said, I'm out. Like, yeah. Yeah. I'm not interested in the future of cars. I'm interested in the future of mobility or transportation. I want to come to um, Numo in a second, um, because I think that's where, you know, your sort of understanding of the system nature and the, and the, 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 the um, uh, the externalities, the downs, the re the need to get it right on a on a on a much broader network, a much broader basis comes together. But before we do that, if if I'm if I might, um, you are a very successful woman entrepreneur, and I mean, is that when when I say that, do you think you know? Uh, do, do you bridle at that and you just say, look, I'm just an entrepreneur, I'm just, you know, or or, or is there a part of your story that is specific to the fact that you're a woman? Um, when I was doing all of those startups, I was, I didn't feel that I was discriminated against and I was kind of irritated when people would bring it up. The farther I get from those moments, the more I appreciate that I was an incredibly outlying person and that a huge amount of my issues came from the fact that I was a woman. And when a man did that same thing, it was considered simple and straightforward, or I want to say um, that absolutely I was discriminated against when I was fundraising in particular, I'd say particularly with fundraising, um, I was discriminated against. And, and to this piece, I just, I want to, I want to say that so venture capitalists in their minds are thinking that they are not discriminatory. Um, but one time I had, so let me tell you this story. I went to visit a venture capitalist in Harvard Square, which is about a mile from my house. And I decided to ride my bike and I got there early because I got there so fast <laughs> by bike rather than by other method. So I was sitting in the reception area waiting. And as I was sitting and waiting, I was watching the VCs come and interact with the receptionist in that area. And it was the most striking thing. All the, all the VCs were men and they were coming to the receptionist and the, the conversations were, oh, I see you've, they've swapped out to new recycling receptacles. Aren't those pretty? Um, what's for lunch and what's, what's the lunch being brought in and what, you know, when is it coming? What's it being, and what is the bathroom code? Meanwhile, I was also seeing other conversations that were between the men and the conversations between the, the VC men's were, Oh, did you see that company? And then the other guy came in and did you talk about this deal plan? And I was realizing that their interactions with women were all, I want to say mundane nothing to do with business and economics and innovation. So I feel that men, and I would say, and women, and I want to say um, entrepreneurs, women entrepreneurs who have children, we have a kind of super bond. And so when I talk to a female entrepreneur, I have a stronger bond than when I talk to an entrepreneur who's a man. And if I talk to an entrepreneur who's also a mother simultaneously, as I was, I have a super bond. So I feel like that is an underappreciated thing. And then when I watched my successor at Zipcar, um, all these relationships that I had created over my time, he walked into and in a minute and a half, oh yeah, we went to the same schools, we played the same sports and we blah, blah, blah. And it was like this instant. And I thought, like, I thought I had a bond with these guys, but it was a bond that was slower to make and harder no, to do no. because I was a woman. So 
Do you, I, do you yeah. think that just the ideas of shared vehicles and the way you've built your businesses, you know, would a, would a guy have seen that opportunity and understood the value proposition in the same way? Do you think that there was an advantage there? I mean, well, when we go to stereotypes, of course not. <laughs> so I'm sure some men, some men did, and some men started yeah. those companies. But as I look at it, I just feel like at Sipcar, we did so many beautiful, beautiful things. And it was because I was doing things in what we think of as more feminine Oh. ways that relationships really mattered to me providing a value a value proposition that was f- very firm treating people with extreme respect uh, not lying <laughs> i mean all of those things i would no, say i would say that I mean, there must the, be practical things like also just thinking through the security aspect of being somewhere and having to sort of not fumble for keys but fumble for a code and just you know that you're going to be in some of those environment. some of those things but i would um you know so now there's many studies out on women entrepreneurs and they say yeah. women run much leaner companies right. that we we waste money yes. less less we um have less turnover in our companies um, women are famous for multitasking and having been able to do strat- longer term strategies. So I feel I, like all of those counted. I have an, inv- an angel investment in a woman CEO led company. It is also the only company where the CEO is absolutely on top of the variable costs and the unit profitability from day one, from month one, from six months. And there's none of this kind of, oh, I'm just going to go and talk to some bro and get another million dollars if I haven't figured it out because I'm going to move fast and break things. It's like, no, it, you know, it, it's just, it is, it's, I don't know. And like, obviously I, that's too small a data point to know if that's because she's a woman, but, but my goodness. I want to say profoundly, detail. profoundly yeah. for me, that was exactly the case is that I knew all of those things. And I was just reading some, uh, a parody <laughs> article on all brands now trying to become being authentic and thinking about their consumers and caring. And, and I thought, we were that from day zero because yeah. I really did care about my consumers yeah. and I really, they were the number ones. And I actually didn't think of them as consumers. I thought of them as partners, but it was very much. So I'd say all of those were women's tendencies. Yeah. It's stereotypes, but yes. This is a really important um, topic. And I'm, I'm also, I'm going to think of other um, you know, guests that I can bring in because we've had uh, Nancy fund who was the 2006 first investor in Tesla and I asked her similar questions to say, well, you know, did you see that opportunity? All the other VCs laughed at a car company and she saw it. And, and, mm-hmm. and I, I asked her whether it was just a different perspective and so on. But we've got a problem still, just the, the sheer math, the, the arithmetic of how many women, women VCs and how many women entrepreneurs or C-suite in entrepreneurial startups there are is still dramatically underrepresented. And I don't know what to do about it. There was an interesting article I read just this morning, I think in the New Yorker that I would encourage you to read that is about the venture capital realm. And it was using WeWork, which I want to say is the most extreme, extreme, extreme example of all the bad things that can happen. But I would- More extreme than Uber. Which was extreme. (laughs) And if we- I, just as we talk about this gender piece of both investors and VCs, I would say the excesses of, of WeWork's investors and the excesses of WeWork's founders would be so, we would be so hard pressed to imagine women doing those things. Yeah. That, so I feel like they're, just as I was reading this article and they don't mention gender at all, but I was just, as reading, I was just thinking, it's kind of inconceivable to me that I would, walk in and after a 15 minute conversation and say, I'll give you $1.4 billion. Like no matter how clever I thought I was, that would, I just could not imagine doing it yeah. or spending money on as the, as a CEO, spending money on all sorts of crazy, crazy things that I feel like my investors money, yeah. I felt so much responsibility to do well by that money. Like it was yeah. another huge burden in and the, the. And the funny thing is I, I felt, those things which you know in a way you're now characterizing as you know sort of the women's approach to entrepreneurship when i was at new energy finance but i was in my 40s and i can almost guarantee if i hand on heart had i started a company at 25 i don't want to say i would have been a 
but there's a very good chance I'd have been. A yeah, but I started Zip Car when I was 42, so maybe I was also um, cleverer maybe then as well. So, okay, great topic for later <laughs> for, for another cleaning up. Sort of, you know, what what are the you know what are the age trajectories, gender differences in VCs and entrepreneurs? We will come back to that. Let's move on now to NUMO, and that stands for New Urban Mobility. And I was very proud because I worked that out. Um, little help from Google. Um, and I suspect that a lot of, I just thought, it, well, it's a, that's a cute name. That's great. Uh, but then I thought, well, there's probably knowing Robin, there's more to it than that. So talk, to, talk me through how you went from um, Zipcar and then those other startups. And then suddenly you're doing this kind of network of cities and stakeholders and, and so on around the design of our future cities. And, and what were the steps in between? So NUMO was created because as I flew around the world with a big carbon footprint and talked to different governments and, and I'd say innovative companies, what was striking to me in the realm of urban transportation was that cities were so angry at some of the startups, as you know. So Uber and Lyft and then the scooter companies and the shared bicycles, they were so angry that you companies are coming in and you're destroying all these things we had. Yet when I talked to the CEOs and policy people in those companies, they would say, cities never tell us what they want. They have no idea what they want. And there's just this complete disconnect. So NUMO was, um, so because of that, I convened 10 of the world's largest city and transportation NGOs. And we spent seven months pounding out something called the shared mobility principles for livable cities. And so there are 10 of them. And the idea was to have these 10 principles that were high, were high level, were applicable to 95% of the cities to which cities and business and NGOs could jointly agree, here's where we want to go. And so I'll tell you some of, you know, some of them are things like when we, we build we build cities and transportation together. So we build buildings and transportation together. We don't do them without thinking about the other, or we move people and not cars, or we make efficient use of all of our assets, meaning streets and curbs and vehicles. Like we wanna make efficient use of things. So there are these 10 and we have today, I think 400, some very large and many innovative companies that have signed on. And so NUMO, is this alliance of entities that share common values. And, and through that sharing, can we, through the shared values, can we more quickly get to this, I'd say the, the mission of the problem, the mission statement is, you know, we all wanna build sustainable, just and equitable cities. And here's in the transportation realm, here are 10 principles that help you get there. So NUMO, has been doing that. And of course, that's a, a huge, crazy giant ask. And that's why it's an alliance. And so we've been working with a number of partners at different paces and different, different depths. Um, C40, I think that's London based among them. Um, right now, one of the things that NUMO is thinking a lot about for this upcoming year are, I'd say two points. One is addressing the systemic race of racism in the U.S. that's come up, which I, we will note exists in every country. Um, sometimes it's black people, sometimes it's people of color, sometimes it's indigenous, but that type of um, keeping a certain class and group down is kind of ubiquitous. And the other piece, because we're really focused on urban transportation, is to get us all looking more at the journeys that are less than three miles in distance, five kilometers in distance, which are 50% of the trips that right now in wealthy countries are being done by car everywhere. Um, so I I can discuss this yeah. thesis with you more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I, so what, one of the things as you were um, talking about the shared principles, right? Yep. Yeah. If we just go back to the shared principles that you mentioned. Um, one of the things that you, you actually emailed me an early version. And in preparation for this, I went back to my emails and I looked at my comments on it, which were, which, uh, and they have evolved. I love the 10 principles. Absolutely love them. And by the way, what we'll do is we'll put a link into the show notes. Good work. Um, and, and so, um, 
you know, everybody can, you know, log in and they can look at them and marvel at how fantastic they are. And then presumably they can join NUMO. NUMO. Yes. yes. They can cho- say, they I want to be part of the shared mobility principles. Yes. Yes. But, you know, in the early versions, the thing that sort of triggered me, because I, I come at this as a sort of either, you know, partly as a conservative, but also thinking about, well, you want to build a big tent. You're also going to need people who are on the center right and on the right of the political divide. And you had a number of things in there that I was like, uh, red flag, you know, all data will be pulled, only renewable energy will be used. Every shared vehicle, every every autonomous vehicle must be shared. And there were That's still that there. Happened. Number yeah. 10. They're not really still there. Some of them are not, or at least you manage. Right, to- right, right. Some no, and yeah. that was that was what happens when you work with uh, ten people for three hours every two weeks over seven months from different cultures and different backgrounds, and it was torturous work yes. of negotiation and conciliation. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, you know, if those principles are still there, you've removed the hot button language, the red flags, you know, because I can sit here and say, you know, I, I could say I see nothing objectionable. Uh, it is clearly one, one of the things that's very interesting. You do have to have one, you do have to accept one starting point, which is that the city is full of um, shared resources or that the city is, you know, that, that, that it's not an individualistic um, a created entity in the sense that uh, there are externalities to almost everything you do in a city. You don't put your garbage out right, there's an externality. You're going to get rats and your neighbor's going to complain. You don't park so, right, you're going to, you know, so it's all about Michael, managing those externalities, which even a conservative has to accept that there are externalities. If you don't accept that, then you check out from the whole thing, I, I guess. But that's just Michael, simple. this was an interesting analysis I just read about the current, the recent election in the US circles back to that, that people who live in cities recognize the huge importance of government because at each and every moment we're having to negotiate with a whole bunch of people and those rules make sense and government's part in those rules make sense. If you live in a rural area, you think that government doesn't exist and you don't ever see your neighbors, they're all far away. And so it feels to people in rural areas as though the government is irrelevant and don't get in my business. And I had just never thought about that as where you live and where your everyday interaction is. Those of us who live in dense urban areas think, wow, we really need to have a set of rules here so that we can work together. Just a side observation. Yeah, no, it's it's a it's a good one. I was having an observation about there was a there was a. if you look at the question between wind power per capita and political choices, what you actually find is it's the red states with more wind. And so what somebody was trying to hypothesize was that the red, that, that the red states love wind. Whereas I was thinking, well, hang on a second, they're just rural and rural areas are better for wind. And there's probably no, no causal correlation at all. But yours but is- Then you have the wind. offshore wind. You're, the you're, offshore, and you have offshore wind, which is where dense- yeah conurbations can see them. And yeah, I think, I think we are selfish in many ways, right? It's the not in my backyard. I love this idea until you want to do it next door and then suddenly I don't like it anymore. Yeah. Well, what, you know, one thing, there's a subtext here, which is that this polarization, somehow, you know, people like you, people like me, we're going to have to sort of help to bring sides together because this fragmentation is really, really damaging. Hey, let me tell you, let me tell you the story that's triggering the thing that I've been working on recently. So I was still pre-pandemic days and I was leaving the Washington DC airport. I had just gone through security and the person immediately behind me in the security line was Elizabeth Warren. And so I turned to her. She looks famous. I don't look famous. Um, And so I turned to her and I said, Elizabeth, I've been really wanting to talk to you about your transportation policy. And she said, oh, um, what do you think about raising the gas tax? So you and I, the fuel tax, I'd say for British audiences, and you and I will know that in America, the fuel tax has been desperately low, completely out of whack. Anybody who's ever worked in transportation is constantly, constantly wanting to raise the fuel tax. Here was the amazing part. One One of the amazing parts was I thought about it for a minute. And then I said, you know what? I don't think you should raise the gas tax because it's, um, it, I'm forgetting the word now, it's becoming, it's become, it's an obsoleting tax. 
And so don't lose any political ta- yeah. capital on this because it's, it's an obsolete text. Yeah. It's going to become irrelevant. Yeah. Right. And then she said to me, oh, thank goodness, because I'm really worried about the rural poor. Then we said goodbye. And then I went and sat by myself in my own plane going to wherever I was going. But what struck me at that moment was, wow, when you're a politician running at a national level for president, um, why transportation is never discussed is because it's a very polarizing thing depending on where you live. And so I was thinking long and hard for the next months. And then I came up with an idea and I've been working on it for the last year. What is a transportation issue that is not, that would be universally liked and is relevant to people in rural areas, people in suburban areas and people in urban areas? Are you ready? Yes, let's go for it. What is your, and, and what did you come up with then as the unifying principle of transportation? So my unifying principle is there's a piece of infrastructure that we need that is completely lacking at this moment, which is a, a network of sidewalks, cycle tracks, lanes, and trails that are available to pedestrians and people who don't own a driver's license and unlicensed vehicles. And now let me just paint that for you a little more. 50% of the population right now, as we're sitting talking, either doesn't have a a driver's license or doesn't have access to a car at this minute. 50% of the population is completely trapped in a car dominant environment. And so I'm trying to elevate up that this is something that, so who are the 50%? So 20% are children less than 16. 19% are people with physical impairments who will never be able to get a driver's license. There's something like 9%, and this is gonna depend on different countries, who've lost their licenses, perhaps temporarily because they were driving under the influence or had you know, drug issues. There are people who here coming to the US, um, so in the U.S., across the whole U.S., 8% of the households don't have a car. And we might say, oh, 8% is a small percentage. We don't care about them, but we do. But it turns out it's 20% of the black households that don't have a car. Then we can say, okay, what about households where they have one car? 40% of the households have one car. When you're living in a household with more than one person and the person took the car, you're screwed. Yeah. So just as I've been reflecting on this, we're, in transportation, we're always talking about cars and car travel and public transportation, completely leaving out this thing that I'm trying to call the freedom network, which enables us to travel with, for no money or low, low cost and without the need of a driver's license. And so it's And to this place where I I think I started, 50% of all trips are less than five kilometers. So it's not a small amount of travel. And with the rise of e-bikes, which is booming around the world, um, I heard a number yesterday, which I'm going to repeat, but I haven't fact-checked yet, (laughs) which was 40 million e-bike, 40 million bikes were sold last year, which is one bike for every two cars. It was the biggest year for bikes Ever. So I feel like with the rise of e-bikes, which completely transforms the equation and the distances and the ease, I think we have this ability yeah. to really get people, I think of all those single occupancy vehicles, people do love autonomy yeah. and they do love to go around. Can we convert them into e-bikes? And they would if we had the infrastructure. And my question is, is that a, that's a great, I mean, the observations are all spot on. Um, and then the question is, what do you do with that observation? Is it a business opportunity? Is it a so? Is it new services? Or because you know a lot of discussion in Europe, at least, is around what they call the fifteen-minute city. So we say, well, I would say that completely. So coming to what for me right now, given this stimulus money that's about to happen worldwide, I would like to see this. If you remember after 2008, I don't know what it was like for you in Europe, but in the US, I remember traveling in like 2010 after lots of money had been spent. And I was in Florida and I left the airport and I was on this highway that looked like it had been 
cleaned with a toothbrush and you could have dinner off of it. Basically, all the shovel-ready projects were let's build wider, more, more sparkling, more spectacular highways to, to the deficit of everything else. So I think, yes, some of this infrastructure money should go towards maintaining highways and maintaining bridge, bridges for that. Yep. In our wealthy countries, we could be spending some of that money on building up this network. Okay, no. uh, and okay, the 15-minute so city is no. part of that. Right. But let me play devil's advocate. And here, you know, we've got this discussion going on in spades at the moment in, in the UK, right? Because during the pandemic, there were various stories around the world of countries that were pop, doing pop-up bike lanes and, 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 and so on, and um, making it more walkable, you know, extending pavements and the rest of it. And astonishingly, the UK got on board with that instead of just saying that's, you know, that, that, that's all, that's change. We don't like change and so on. Actually, um, at the level of the council and even of the, you know, the, 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 the secretary for you know, the department of transport, Grant Shapps put a lot of money, you know, nearly a couple of hundred million pounds into um, bike lanes and, and, and so on. And for a while that was, everybody was, was very excited about that. And I'll tell you something though, the, backlash against that now is extreme it's absurd um it's totally off the scale it's a you know it, it's it's accusing anybody who you know the councils who've put in you know uh bike lanes. what they did is they changed the law and said instead of having to do a consultation before you could put in the bike lane today uh, and then do the consultation afterwards right because the pandemic was going on if you had to do a consultation for 12 weeks forget it it was too long so the pushback and the reason for the pushback is that the car, the, the proponents of the car city see it as zero sum. Either there's a bicycle lane or we get to continue our lives as normal. And there's no middle ground at, no middle ground at all in that discussion. So how do you get over that? How do you persuade them that what you're talking about is not an existential threat to their own businesses and way of life and you know, convenience and whatever? Um, exactly. And this is what I've been trying to work on to, I feel, I feel like marketing is everything, right? That we, you can sell people anything, sadly, with good marketing. And I think there's cost benefits of everything. And we need to elevate the costs and elevate the benefits depending on which side. And so this is the piece with this freedom network that I'm really trying to push is I'm really trying to make and I have to do a better job but honestly, in people's own households, they should be able to recognize and see themselves, their children, yep. their parents, their brother-in-law in this group of trapped people yep. that um, I, I, um, I've been thinking that, you know, over the last hundred years, we've made it safer to cross the ocean than to cross the street. And that people are... So, so to this piece around the, the bike lash, a friend of mine um, coined that, Jeanette Sadek Khan. I think there is bike lash and there's two reasons. One, car drivers really don't want to run over pedestrians or cyclists. And so whenever they see a bicyclist on the road, they're thinking, oh my God, now I have to be more careful. I have to go slower or I have to like, so there is this anxiety when a bicyclist is on the road no matter what, they don't want to run them over. And we did take away lanes from cars, but we just need, and, and it's, London has sometimes done a good job of this, but everywhere I feel like we have to elevate the fact that not everyone has a car. Yep. Not everyone has a driver's license. Not everyone has a car that they can get into at this minute and we're trapped without it. But here's the thing. There's also not everyone has a bike. And I, this is what I think. I'm going to kind of slightly answer my own question, which is that, um, you know, th this um, debate is very often, most often, at least in the UK, it's bikes versus cars. Right. And the fact is that bikes are this much, cars are this much. But the vast majority, actually, uh, whether they might use a bike or car as well, is not the issue. But the majority of, thing, of people uh, do things walking. And so, you know, I, I nearly stood for mayor a few years ago and I was going to, here was my strategy. Every time anybody said, so Michael, would you do lots of bike lanes? My strategy was going to be, I love walking. Isn't it important that we should just be able to get places walking? 
you know, don't we need to start by being able to walk and, and you know, for kids to be able to walk to school and, and the rest of it, and maybe scooters are part of walking and so on. But why talk about bicycles? Well, so wait, so because wait, that was a piece of the of the puzzle. But wait, Michael, that was so last January, I was at something called the TRB, Transportation Research Board Conference, where 35,000 people come from all around the world in January. And I was sitting there talking to someone. And that's when I had my aha moment that I need to be talking about a network that is for pedestrians and unlicensed vehicles. And once I say unlicensed vehicles, what I know is it has to be light and it has to be slow because it has to be able to work with pedestrians. Otherwise, I'm going to make no, a no. light no. law. See, I and think this is, I, I think this is, I'm with you. whatever you do, I'm with you because I think that well, you've got to look at um, disability vehicles. You've got to look at scooters, kids, scooters, kids, bicycles. We're getting all this kind of caught up in this kind of the bike lash versus car wars. But, and then you've got the other one, which I think is really interesting is autonomous uh, delivery the little, the little, you know, uh, delivery vehicles, because everybody gets all excited about drones and they think they're going to get their next Amazon or their pizza by drone. No, what you're going to get is a little thing that trundles along the pavement. Oh, Michael, let's have an argument. Let's go. Are you ready to have a fight right now? Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. I'm up for it. <laughs> you don't like every that. time. Every time this. I feel like every on Twitter, every once in a while, there'll be a new company that's coming up and it has the picture of the little grocery delivery no. drone going down the sidewalk. And every time that comes up, I say, I, it has kind of, people have a special name for it. And then I say, oh, is this as opposed to, and then you have the little wire basket that grandma has been carrying behind her for the last 150 years. Yeah. And, and I look at it and I think, how, how challenging is that? to like, do we need drones? Our sidewalks are already incredibly crowded. And if you like, particularly in cities that we don't, why are we so lazy in cities that we need to have everything brought to us? Like, can't you go, go walk those two blocks, go do it. Why, and I am, I'm being driven crazy. And I just heard that, I think it's Amazon is actually doing experiments with drones delivering things like toilet paper, and toothbrushes, which is what I've been joking about forever. You see, I, so I have a I have a solution to that, which is just that um, that that you know when they're doing their deliveries of you know a toothbrush, that, that this is about curbside pricing. You know, there's lots of talk about lane pricing and and um, you know dynamic road pricing. Uh, the problem is that uh, it's very different challenge to charge somebody for driving down a road is one thing, but if they stop and they block the traffic and they double park. Uh, that's a very different externality, a much higher cost of society. And so in my world of the city, my vision of the city is that you have these delivery and pickup bays. And if you want to use it, it costs you a buck or it costs you a pound or whatever it is. And then you can go deliver your toothbrush and you'll double its cost. Um, but, you know, that, that that so for me, that's a source of revenue. I agree with you. I and, agree with you. And, and the same on the pavement. If you want to have a little thing trundles along, uses the sidewalks are not that crowded in urban, in, in residential areas. And if that one, if you want to do the toothpaste delivery by by a little autonomous thing that rolls along the pavement, why not? Who does it harm? I mean, if they pay a pound to the city, pff, you know, good luck. Let me tell you, um, I was having this argument with my colleague who is head of transportation for the city of Pittsburgh because she... And out of Pittsburgh, there was a startup, which we will make all these things nameless. And they were doing the little curbs, the little sidewalk drone thing. And then there was the most terrible robot, just to be clear for the audience. These are things on wheels, not flying, right? Right. Things on yeah. wheels, running on sidewalk. So a young student who goes to Carnegie Mellon is wheelchair bound. And she had, she posted onto Twitter a little video she took of herself trying to go to cross in, she was in the crosswalk where the lane curbs goes up and right in front of her was this little drone. And the drone was trying to decide, I guess, whether it wanted to go in the crosswalk, turn left, turn right, whatever. The drone was sitting in the curb cut at that moment for like, uh, for some minutes. She was in the crosswalk and the light changed and she could not get up past it. So yeah. she was just, so, I mean, it was, I want to say it was amusing and that this was woman was, she's a very smart, well-educated woman who's in a wheelchair and she was, she did it. She was talking about in an amusing, this is a real problem. I know this is a startup. This is, 
but it was a very funny little counter to my point on the sidewalks and the drones. The, the, the reason but, these things are complicated is because your earlier answer, which is let her walk to the shops to get her toothpaste, her milk, her whatever. Well, actually, maybe she should be able to stay at home and not have to do that. Sounds like a, you know, she may, you know, she may, she may want to go to the shops. She may not. The point is that. Well, you know what, Michael? When we charge the pound per delivery, and I want to even make it higher, if you're disabled, you won't have to pay that tax. If we think about all the externalities you and I are always talking about, they're, they're due to scarcity. Like you would tax when there's scarcity or externalities. Um, so, one of the things that's been driving me crazy that the pandemic has, it was making me really anxious before, and the pandemic has completely said, Robin, too late, which is, all of us shopping online and, and on-demand services because it's the complete ruination of urban retail. And if I lived in the country, shopping online is not a problem. But for those of us who live in cities, we do actually value having a corner store or having, having retail, which Amazon and other delivery services is completely wiping out. And so we can think about the pandemic. All of us have now learned and got these ingrained habits where we want everything delivered and we'll never go outside of our house. But when I was thinking about this, a, a tax for this or, or how to think about this, I want to throw out to you one of my dream policy things. So in dense urban areas, where there is this scarcity of space and where I'd like to see retail. I would like to charge, I'm gonna make up a number, two pounds 50 per delivery with three exceptions. Exception number one is delivered by the post, postal service because now it's all consolidated one delivery per day. You don't have to pay for it. Number two, you do it in a zero emission micromobility. In other words, all those bike lanes that have now been building, you're going to go from the big truck to a small, a small bike thing, and so no delivery charge there. Or number three, if it's coming from a place which has a retail footprint in my city. So I'm putting my thumb on the scale for retail stores and retail delivery. So I've just, as we've moved to this space with the ubiquity of on-demand delivery and I was in Manhattan once with my daughter, who I will say was in the hospital having just delivered her baby, but there were six deliveries a day yeah. at that day at her house. And Sydney's can't and shouldn't accommodate that kind of volume. So the, the, for me, the solution to this is curbside pricing, because there's this big discussion about lane, dynamic lane pricing, dynamic road pricing. And I just don't think that the debate is sophisticated enough. It doesn't yet include this idea of curbside pricing, because to, to be honest, that double parked vehicle that backs up all the traffic could be an Uber pickup or a Lyft pickup. It could be a uh, delivery. It could be essential groceries, not essential. But I, so the way in, in, in my sort of policy ask, it's that we separate those two and we say, okay, we, you know, I don't think it's controversial to, to say, right, dynamic road pricing, lane pricing, but also curb pricing. Because then what you get is as you move to those shared vehicles and you don't need so many cars and so many parked cars, you can start to add bays where people can do all those pickups and all those drop-offs. They can pull in, do all that stuff, not creating a traffic problem, which costs society enormously, but they have to fund then they have to pay their booking fee and that then funds the city services, the road upkeep and all those, you know, bike. So lane. Michael, Go on. I would, I would say I agree with you and I would come at it a different way. Every vehicle has three modes. Mode number one, it's moving. Mode number two, it's parked. Mode number th or it's at the curb. Mode number three, it's stored in dense urban areas. We're going to be charging you where there's scarcity. I'm going to be charging you differentially for each one of those, but they are separate. Oh. So when people are always saying builds, you know, I want more parking in my neighborhood. I think, okay, so you're saying you want more parking, but that's going to mean more cars are moving. And to your point, the double parking and the curve space is another scarce resource. And we need yeah. to decide how well, we're going to meter that. So I, what do you say to those people who say, you know, Robin, Michael, you're completely, this is all nonsense because we're going to have autonomous, driverless, you know, electric taxis 
Nobody's going to own a car because you'd be stupid to own a car because you'll click your fingers on a digital app and the car will appear and it'll be wonderful. It won't have a driver because you don't need a driver. And all of these problems just, they just magically go away, don't they? Yeah, so that was my, that was my work of the last year, wasn't it? So my work of the last year is um, if we had autonomous vehicles that with no driver, what I learned when I was doing Zipcar is that everyone decides to use their car. All the costs are sunk costs. So we only care about the marginal cost. And the marginal cost is, what does it cost to park? It's expensive parking. I don't want to take my car down there. Or what is the price of fuel? I'm driving some long distance. So fuel, tolls, and parking. That's how I evaluate it. Once you have an autonomous vehicle, all of those costs, the marginal cost of an electric vehicle is about a penny and a half a kilometer. So it's a, a penny and a half a mile, so a penny a kilometer. We have now suddenly taken out the single greatest cost with my human self. And so when that is no longer in that autonomous vehicle, my marginal cost of moving that vehicle is this one cent a kilometer. And it's if you not- live in the city, Michael, for 50 pence, where would I not go? Where would I not send that vehicle? I, I'll have it. I will definitely have it. Go get the toothbrush, get a shoelace, go circle around the box 45 times because I don't care if you, I don't, I'm never going to pay for parking because parking will always be more expensive than me just keeping that very vehicle circling moving. And it's because of the advent of autonomous vehicles that I've been saying we need to get at the root issues that apply to cars today and are going to apply triply to autonomous vehicles, which are the moving costs when you're in a congested space. We absolutely have to do congestion pricing when you're for the moving vehicles. We absolutely have to do curbside pricing for vehicles today, all those double parking ones. And we also have to get the storage prices right, which might disappear with autonomous vehicles. But we have to get that balance because in fact, the balance of storage versus moving costs, because otherwise people will just keep them moving, right? So, so those are the three components and the autonomous vehicle future for me, I very much look forward to it in terms of reducing car accidents and adding mobility to people who don't have it. But if we don't get that pricing right, it is a 100% worst case scenario because people will just use them for any old thing. And that's the genesis of the 10 principles, is it not? Yes. And which is where I said, and now you're yelling at me that in dense urban areas, autonomous vehicles should be electric and shared. Um, Yeah. But we really have to get this pricing right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I'm not sure. I'm not yelling at you now. I was yelling at you at then because some of the language was all was fairly sort of coercive language as opposed to principled language. So, so yeah. this ties back though to something else when you're talking about the bike lash. Yeah. As I've been talking to people over the last three years about this, what's been really striking to me talking to local government officials is they so hate and are terrorized of the idea of raising prices for congestion pricing or the cost of parking, that they would rather do lane reallocation. And lane reallocation accomplishes the same thing. So as to say, you know what? I don't want to have three lanes of vehicles because they're moving one human at a time or having zero people in them. So I'm going to do lane reallocation. I'm gonna say, this is a bike lane. I'm taking two car lanes and I'm turning into one car lane and two moving bike lanes. And I, or we take out on street parking, which is what Oslo has been doing very, very successfully and Stockholm did successfully, right? We're just taking away the on street parking, which means you can never stop in my city so you won't drive here anymore. Because, so I wanna, I wanna be clear that if you hate the words coming out of my mouth, Robin, you're constantly talking about user fees and taxes and that's terrible. Okay, the alternative is we take away the space for cars and we reassign it for people, moving people and not, cars. So we, we, we think about how do we move the most people in these dense urban areas? How do we make sure that people have mobility? And I don't, I'm not going to focus on whether it's by car or not. And, and, and I mean, the things that were triggering me back in the early versions of the 10 principles were, were just things like sort of, you know, uh, saying that all autonomous vehicles had to be shared. And I was thinking, well, what about, you know, tradespeople who have 
um, you know, a very specific vehicle. I, I use the example of a, of a glass, you know, one of those vehicles that carries panes of glass. You know, can you really force that person to share that vehicle just because they want to use an autonomous vehicle? They want to send that vehicle out and so on. So there were some examples. It was just some red, you know, hot button areas. But I think, you know, one of the things that I think, you know, we, just in the interest of time, we're going to need to draw to a close, this question of the politics, you know, you can kind of, as technocrats and, you know, uh, technocrats and visionaries in your case, um, you can kind of come up with the right answers, but the politicians, I mean, parking is an absolute, you know, it's a third rail issue. It's just any, any politic, any local politician that says, I want to be elected and I'm going to remove your parking. Um, even though there's relatively small, you know, less than 50% of people have cars and so on, guaranteed their political career will be over quicker than you know what. So how do you get this stuff done? This is why we're going to circle back around to my Freedom Network. I recognize that people who drive their cars right now think, if you take my car away or if you make it more expensive, I have no other options. I am 100% But Can I, can I challenge that though, Robin? I'm going to challenge because I tell you why, because, you know, um, my sister's very active in Chiswick, which is, I don't know if you're familiar with London's West London, and there's a bike lane war going on where, you know, what the, the, um, the local priest said that uh, this was more damaging to the community, putting in a bike lane was more damaging to the community and to the infrastructure of Chiswick than the Blitz. That was a priest who said that, right? And we've got the same thing going on in Kensington. And, you know, you can go out there and you can say, look, the data shows that everybody manages to do their shopping, that the shops do well, that the rents go up if you have a bike lane, that amazingly people on bicycles are more likely to stop and do some shopping than people- Because they don't have to park. Run, right? You can show <laughs> as much data as you want. It serves nothing. It just enrages. Okay, them. here. Here, so this is another piece that Numa was working on last year. And London, um, London's done sometimes, but famously in New York and in Stockholm, was thing about congestion pricing or bike lanes is let's, and COVID has offered this opportunity, let's do some pilots. So this is just a pilot. Don't worry about it. We're going to tweak things. We're going to see how it's going to work. It's only going to be for six months. Don't everyone have a heart attack. If we don't like it after six months, we'll be able to change it or we'll be able to change things. And when people, I want to say some places, bike lanes maybe don't make sense, right? But when people get the places where they do make sense, when we can finally have a pilot and people live through it and no, everyone didn't have to go live in their basement because it was like the Blitz and they all died, and half of them died. So they will get to see, oh, yeah. wow, you know, my kid could go to school or could go to the library, could go to their friend by themselves, or it wasn't so terrible, or I did have my shopping or, but I so pilots I think are the dream. But the Pilots. lived experience right now in London is, is that there, is, there isn't a kind of, oh, well, that wasn't so bad. And actually, it's quite nice. And, you know, my kids love it. And it's, it's really not that. It is, you know, it is, it is you know. What happened? I need to understand why. As an example from um, Kensington, the, the MPs have just written a letter to whoever, I don't know, to TfL, I think, to Transport for London saying, 96% of their post bag was people demanding that the low traffic neighborhood or the, no, it wasn't even a low traffic neighborhood, that the bike lane is inappropriate and must be removed. 96%. And that's partly it was organized and it was very vocal. And I'm sure if you actually asked, if you really polled properly, you'd probably find that you're right. But the fact is, it is political, you know, just just kryptonite. This is just going, it's, it's, it's horrible at the moment. Here. My brother, it is horrible. And I was just hearing about it on Twitter. And I'm wondering, I'm hoping that the pedestrian and micro mobility people can get their own letter writing campaigns. So the pedestrians, this is the problem. The cyclists are organized, but the general, I want to just pop to the shops, get some milk. I want to just scoot my kids to school without being, you know, threatened by an SUV or by a bicyclist in Lycra. Those people are not organized. They're not vocal. They're not organized. They're just, yeah. they just, you know, yeah, that's My brother has been doing bicycle lanes in Somerville, which is a city, in a Boston, suburb yeah. of Boston. Yeah. Yeah. And for the streets that he, that they want to put bike lanes through, he puts a flyer at every single door 
And then he has these very intimate block by block community yeah. meetings. And he says, when you do it block by block, there's this gigantic, yeah. but yeah, that's arduous. And, so and that's I, very interesting because that, that then comes down to a whole different set of issues around the revival of democracy, local democracy, engagement, inclusion, because so many of the people who benefit are actually not politically included, you know, anyway. Uh, and so that's a, uh, that's a whole different, that's probably a whole different cleaning up that we're going to need to get. I'll maybe have to think about, uh, you know, who can come in and, uh, and, and, and best unwrap that one. But you were, that piece around who yells loudest, I mean, this happens also in my neighborhood. We didn't get a bike lane and I went to the community re- meeting and I made my, my first mistake was I went, I was among the first two or three people to speak. And I said, you know, I work, this is my area of expertise. I work around the world. Here's the facts. Here's what it means. Here, I live in this neighborhood. Here's blah, blah, blah. And then the next 25 people stand up and they say (laughs) these crazy things that are not true. And it just wipes it all out. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so so there's a, there's the message. Then we need to get much more politically savvy so that we can bring the political agenda and the technocrat visionary agendas all together. That's going to be the plan. That is what I think is happening. Hopefully, in the U.S. and actually, definitely the U.K. If we think about the Extinction Rebellion or Black Lives Matter or the Sunrise Movement, is youth who are incredibly skilled at community organizing, who are doing the step-by-step, block-by-block, person-by-person, cohort building. You know what? You, you and I do know that they're going to win in the end. And the, their approach is slow and steady. Yes and no. I mean, I think what will happen is, I, I see it a bit, again, you know, just nuances of difference. I think that, you know, kind of they're over there, the, the, the mainstream is here. What will win in the end is, is actually something in between through some process that can either be painful or less painful. And maybe that's something that we can work on. They're not going to win. You know, they're saying we've got to be off, off CO2 by 2025. I mean, it's crazy. And, and, and it's, no, they're not going to win on that. They're going to get, you know, we're going to get off CO2 by 2050, but not by 2025. Probably and, and not by 2025, but we do have to go faster. And I guess this comes to this piece around the vision and living, being able to live that future yeah. and realizing it's not so bad. In fact, it's great. Yep. Comes back to the status quo. So just the other piece uh, tying in with the pandemic is as I was watching children, my, my young adult children and others, in the pandemic, all of these things that were cultural expectations of their future were, were slapped away, right? So you're not going to have a graduation. You're not going to get to go do that trip with your friends. You're not going to get to do these things that everyone's always done at this point in their life. Um, and I was, feeling, I was feeling very empathetic with that transformed, that loss of a culturally built future. And I think that is our challenge for us trying to build a sustainable future. Because the reality is the the last hundred years of industrialization and capitalism have teed us up very poorly for creating a sustainable, equitable planet. And so our, our expectations and visions have to change. And so that's, that's cultural work, and that's very, very challenging. Robin, I could talk to you for hours and hours, but unfortunately, uh, you know, we have to draw this to a close, and that's a great point to conclude. Um, and I'll leave it hanging whether I completely agree with you or only mostly agree with you or partially agree with you. But let's leave it there. Next time you and I will hopefully meet in per- person. Well, absolutely, absolutely. You know, let's let's hope that uh, that having uh, after that great polemic, you can jump on a plane and come to Europe. <laughs> I know I'm not allowed. I'm not allowed. You see, it's hard. These things are really tough, but it's just fantastic to you know to 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 engage and grapple with them with you. Thank you. It was lovely, and I'm glad you're doing this, Michael. Thank you. So that was Robin Chase successful serial entrepreneur and deep thinker, visionary thought leader on the future of mobility and of cities. My guest next week on Cleaning Up 
is James Cameron. Not the James Cameron who directed Titanic, but when it comes to climate change, he is nevertheless box office gold. Our James Cameron is a barrister. He's an advisor. I first met him when he was leading Climate Change Capital, one of the first financial institutions to deal with funding climate action. He's also an expert on trade. Please join me next week for a conversation with James Cameron. Mm -hmm.